And this was certainly not the news that I was expecting to receive today. But according to um, Kit Clarenberg, who I know is a friend of your program, he's someone that I definitely respect greatly, uh, despite not having yet been able to speak to him, but following his work on the gray zone and elsewhere. Uh, he broke today that Gonzalo Lira is dead. Uh, he broke this on January 12th. For those of you who might watch this later, he said this was confirmed by his family. And even though he disagreed with him about everything, he should not have died in Ukrainian jail, which we can talk about a story. Let's look at what Alex Rubenstein had to say. He was another journalist who's contributed to the gray zone. I think he is a writer for the gray zone and other elsewhere. He said, it's great sadness. He announces that Gonzalo Lira passed away in a hospital, according to his father, who has been fighting to get his son much needed medical attention in recent weeks. Here is the handwritten note Gonzalo, from Gonzalo, which he received on January 4th, saying, I have double pneumonia, both lungs, as well as pneumothorax and severe case of edema. It all started in mid-October, but he was ignored by the prison. They only admitted that I had pneumonia at December 22nd hearing. I'm about to have a procedure to reduce your edema pressure, which is causing me shortness of breath to the point of passing out after minimal activity or even just taking two minutes. You all might not be able to see. That's the letter, though. Um, so Gonzalo's father wrote, I cannot accept the way my son died. He was tortured, extorted and incommunicado for eight months and 11 days. And the U.S. Embassy did nothing to help my son. The responsibility of this tragedy is the dictator Zelensky and the concurrence of a senile American president, Joe Biden. So this is certainly a breaking story and one that I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on, Sarah. So first, your your reactions. Again, showing that the United States has no political power it, uh, uh, when it comes to its puppet states or they just don't care. Um, you know, we watched as they protected uh, is it Michael now, uh, Sarah Ashton, Cyril, whatever, uh, and, and kind of promoted her along the way while we had a journalist in real danger and, and, and his family had been petitioning the United States since the first time he was, he was apprehended and he was released, uh, trying to get him kind of out of there. And, and he always said, you know, I can't leave for whatever reasons. And, and, and that doesn't even, that's not even the point. The point is, is that we've allowed fascist we've endorsed fascist regimes and allowed them to kill our own citizens i want people to understand what this really means it's not about gonzalo it is but it isn't we watch ukraine now kill journalists with impunity they killed dasha dugina they killed tatarsky now they killed gonzalo lira they killed countless or they almost killed wyatt reed they've almost killed patrick lancaster now we look at their their brother in arms israel who kills journalists all over the place. What we're seeing is a very good extended metaphor, not to get too melodramatic, is they're fine with, they prefer it this way. They want these alternative uh, journalists being being murdered. They like, they they want that. That's okay. Um, you know, what, what about the laws we've seen in Canada? What about the uh, journalists that are now trapped in Russia because they can't go back to their homes in the EU? Um, this is part of the plan. If Gonzalo Lira was just a kind of a casualty to that, like it's, it's good, it's good for them. And, 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 and that's why, and I've been stressing this all day, not for engagement or not for shares or likes or anything, but the, the drawing these parallels showing that, so Gonzalo didn't die in vain in a, in a seedy, disgusting Ukrainian dungeon supported by Joe Biden and Victoria Nuland and their ilk. And now we're watching our other friends being murdered on purpose in Lebanon and Gaza because they're reporting the truth from there with press mm -hmm. across their chest. So I think that it's really important to drive this, what happened to Gonzalo really home because it's happening again around us and and you know i don't know if you have been but there's other people that have been casualties of the of the government because for telling the truth in other ways gray zone being robbed of their of their uh fundraiser uh, myself being harassed by the fbi scott ritter and whatever has happened to him legally and, and you know it, these are all things that need to constantly be talked about we're losing journalists they're being killed by governments that our government supports that tells us that they don't care about keeping us safe and we have so we have to keep each other safe that's the point we have to support we have to share we have to protect these alternative journalists gonzalo was literally in harka for a year 
for a year. I mean, yeah, everybody supported and loved him, but where did that get him? He's still dead. So, you know, like this is stuff that needs to be talked about. This is stuff that people need to be educated on. This is stuff that I, I, people that share the New York times need to be told about, like, this is serious. This is really serious stuff. Like the truth is, is the casualty here along with Gonzalo. Like, mm -hmm. again, like I said, I wasn't even a big fan of his politics, but I've been on his show and he was still a colleague. And, and this is, it's a scary, scary world where his family, and this is, this is a person that grew up in the United States, went to school at Dartmouth, is a published author. I was going to say, he, given you said you had disagreement with politics, he, he didn't come out of a background that no. was obscure, so to speak. He was no. a prominent, well, prominent may be a big word, but he was a figure that um, definitely doesn't usually fit the label of someone who gets, um, let's say, disappeared. But here we are. It's that's how bad it has gone that he he made this transition to telling the truth about Ukraine. And now we're now we're at this point. And how many we've lost over 70 journalists in Gaza and Lebanon without blinking, without a blink, blink of an eye. This is a this is a serious issue that needs to I, that really needs to be talked about more. Hmm. Yeah, it's a it, it it's it's a huge part of the geopolitical calculus too, because you hit the nail on the head about uh, the policy the, that this is uh, directly related to what the United States has been doing and and the collective West in general has been doing with regard to Ukraine, but it's related to the entirety. Right, we can go from Ukraine to. Uh, Palestine and and uh, the region, West Asia. We can also go to the Julian Assange case. We can go on and on and on of this attack on, uh, you know, we in the United States love to call free speech. But really what it is, it's an attack on journalism. It's an attack on the ability, independent journalism, the ability to uh, freely be able to express your opinion and your analysis free from what happened to Gonzalo, what's happening to now to Julian Assange, free from really torture and reprisals, which is a war crime. I mean, it, it is a war crime, what's what's happening, because this is in the context of a war. 100% a war crime. You can't kill, deliberately kill anybody that has press on them, an identifier. And they Israel, in all of its maniacal glory, even came after the fact and said, well, yeah, they were wearing their press uniforms, but they were... Have, members of Hamas we have proof right here and you're like that's not that's not doesn't even say they're members of Hamas and who the hell cares after the fact you didn't even know you didn't even know until day, two days after so you killed him without knowing and now you're like we'll file that under whoopsie but actually it was okay here's the justification I mean even just Aussie Cossack who has to live in the Russian embassy or Russian consulate in, in Australia because he can't leave and now he's a Russian citizen. Whether you like him or not, that's not something that is normal. Why did I lose my job, my health care in, in April? That's not normal. Like this isn't normal behavior. And, and it's because you're telling the truth out about things that are happening outside of the United States. It's like it's a really it's a it's a scary concept. And it's something that people need to be more aware of, I think. So we don't continue to lose people like Gonzalo or Shireen or um, Abdul, or all of the others that have been callously murdered. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and and there there's also the silencing. I mean, you've experienced it uh, on all the platforms. We, you mentioned Scott Ritter. I've certainly had my run-ins believing, uh, especially before, I'm not going to credit Elon Musk with much given his behavior, around the Palestine situation. But uh, before he came on, that was very close to being permanently banned from X. But there was, or formerly known as Twitter, there also is, uh, you mentioned Dario Dugina, you mentioned people who have actually been killed now, Gonzalo Lira, another one who's on the hit list, the Ukrainian hit list, uh, the infamous hit list that is claimed to not exist at all. But that's also a real thing. This is part of, in my opinion, it's part of the desperation of this overall policy that the United States has with relation to Ukraine. The, the situation is quite bad 
And so the worse that it gets, it's interesting that this happened at this moment because now this war seems, uh, you know, just lost. And yet still the United States didn't even have the uh, uh, wherewithal or even the will at all to prevent the situation. I mean, I mean, the, it really does feel like uh, maybe a message uh, to all of us uh, yeah. in this moment of, you know, defeat, it seems like from from the U.S. side. It's, and you know what? I think that's the message that other journalists are 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 spe are, are getting as well. Um, I had a, held a, a space earlier where a bunch of independent journalists kind of came and said the same thing. They were like, you know, we have we had journalists from Nicaragua that stopped by. Uh, Alec Rubenstein's brother came by. You know, people that people that knew Gonzalo, people that uh, were his colleagues, and all came on and said the same thing. They're like, this is terrifying. They the this is the United States telling us that they will not protect us. They will not protect us. We already know they don't protect us here inside of the country, but they won't they won't even protect us outside. And that's literally their duty. So what we're watching is a is a is a backslide. We're backsliding right into fascism and that's capitalism and decay. It's that's exactly what's happening. You're seeing it in all facets. The disregard for the other, the the silencing of the truth in journalism, the um the creation of the 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 the, the, the visions, the the the, the machismo and all of it. It's, it's, it's just a backslide into fascism. And the fact that they condone the behavior of two fascist regimes, Ukraine and Israel, just says that we're on our way too. Yeah, and uh, before this show started, there were audience, <laughs> there, were, uh, there was someone in the audience literally saying, don't go anywhere near Ukraine at this point. Oh. I mean, this is how bad it's become. Anyone who... Uh, speaks out about this conflict. I mean, that's how chill. That's how chilling they want the atmosphere to be. They want it to be one where people are afraid, especially in moments where the public opinion is not on the side of the United States, of NATO, of Ukraine. At this exactly. point, if it were, you wouldn't have Zelensky looking and talking like exactly. he has been looking and talking. Exactly. Exactly. They're they're telling you like that's our last line of defense. It's so bad that we got to kill you. Or silence you. We got to go out of our way to, to silence you. So that's really an, an indicative of how bad it really is. Kind of we have to white knuckle it and grit our teeth until finally like something gives. But um, again, like we still have to, how many people will die or how many people will be persecuted in the process is, is, is a mystery. And we do have now uh, uh, reportedly uh, a private email was sent to Gonzalo Lira's father from the State Department acknowledging it was aware of the hospitalization. So here's the email, January 5th dated, all of the redactions to, uh, I guess, protect privacy. So we are aware of Mr. Gonzalo Lira's hospitalization and remain in contact with his lawyer. This was directly from the Department of State, the American Citizen Services Unit at the U.S. Embassy. So... That's, I mean, we knew this, right? Uh, that's just proof of what we knew. Uh, it's, of course, they knew about uh, an American citizen in uh, what was, at least uh, uh, for the last few years, the hottest flashpoint of uh, the United States' uh, military and, and really global political uh, operation. Um, uh, the only. <laughs> I'm not surprised, but I'm also like uh, kind of just dis disgusted. We're in touch with his lawyer. What the hell? Did, you should like, why didn't you supply the lawyer? What the hell is going on? Like you're literally in control of the whole country. That's a terrible cop out. We're talking to his lawyer. You run Ukraine. Yeah. Just yeah. That's interesting. It's almost like a jurisdictional issue too, because yeah. like his, his lawyer in Ukraine. Oh, because you're, yeah, you're respecting. When has the United States respected the judicial process Everywhere. of another, <laughs> or at home. another country? When? Like, it never. It does literally. I mean, what did Elon Musk say uh, uh, with regard to Bolivia? Like, we coo who we want. Like, that's yeah. the attitude. Like, that's literally mm -hmm. the attitude. It's not, oh, well, we're going to. What was the transfer partnership? That was the big problem with the TPP. Yeah. It was that the United States was trying to impose its own 
laws revolving around corporate conduct, especially with copyright, etc., literally impose that through what would be uh, essentially a corporate governance system that stands above any kind of national jurisdiction of what participating countries. So that's that's just a small bit of what the United States does. And in a proxy, like I'm sure I'm uh, you're disgusted. I'm a little bit shocked that that would be the formulaic answer that 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 uh, they're talking to your lawyers. I mean, that to me, that's just another slap in the face. It's just that, uh, well, we don't really care. This is just yeah. what we need to type out to give you a reply. So uh, you don't push the issue further. Which like, and, and you know, Tucker Carlson had his eyes on it. So we really can't get that too much bigger than that in terms of alternative journalism. If you want to call Tucker that, he's kind of mainstream in his own, I don't know, whatever. But still, Tucker Carlson gave it attention. So if we could get it up elevated that high and still the United States is like, we, we called his lawyer. And that's like a sufficient answer. They he tells you they really don't care. They don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think this poses really huge questions about uh, how we navigate what are pretty interesting and complex political times, especially surrounding the conflict in Ukraine. I know you and DD Geopolitics have been really deep in reporting. I mean, the the reports that you do reporting on every single bit and aspect of this conflict is, um, you know, both impressive and also at times like, how, how do you all do that? But it, at the same time, the political, there are political complexities here. There was a huge disagreement about Gonzalo Lira, the person. There is a huge debate among people who follow Ukraine about, uh, you know, what, what was actually going on here? But at the end of the day, now that he is at least reportedly and seemingly with pretty uh, good backing, meaning uh, that there's pretty circum pretty good circumstantial evidence that could lead to just uh, us concluding that he is most likely dead. Given that, I think it's an interesting time to learn that at this point, it isn't so much the ideology that we subscribe to that matters to those who are doing the suppressing, but it is truly the fact that the situation, the overall geopolitical situation that surrounds Ukraine is so delicate, so maybe desperate in many respects, that similar to how I used to characterize the Democrats and neocons, Wall Street, these forces as a big tent that they're trying to form. They're also trying to form a big tent of repression so that um, we also remain very confused and maybe at each other's throats. But nonetheless, we will receive very similar treatment mm -hmm. and it will be acceptable, more acceptable because you know, we are still, we are thinking very much on ideological lines on these issues. It's okay. I believe it's okay to disagree with Coach Red Pill, all of that stuff. Definitely <laughs> not my cup of tea, right? That, that's yeah. not me. Um, certainly, you know, I had questions about his circumstances and all of that. And of course, uh, uh, when we're online and we're just observing the landscape, uh, we're going to have questions about someone living in Ukraine who's disappearing, sure. coming back. And yeah, we're going to have questions, especially with the way that the Ukrainian regime operates. But at Correct. the same time, he's dead. And uh, this this is a, uh, uh, you know, there is something to, you know, uh, events and developments being the educator here. I don't know that there is a single person that is pro-Russia that I hate enough to take the side of Ukraine in their death. Like, that's just, I can't even believe that that's even, um, that's even a discussion, what his politics were like. The Ukraine Ukrainian government literally killed him with the knowledge of the United States consulate, embassy, and government. Like, that's all that you need to know about this. How he died, what he died from, who contacted who. No, that's all you need to know. A journal, An American journalist was killed in Ukraine by a Ukrainian government with the knowledge of the American government because he wasn't even staunchly pro-Russia. He used to say it all the time. I'm not pro-Russia. I'm just pro-peace. I just wanted this to end. And that still wasn't good enough. 
Uh, and then you see the Ukrainians that are kind of like, well, he broke the law. And when you read this draconian, ridiculous the law. law, and you're like, you're the child, you're the um, human trafficking capital of Europe. So it's, what, what laws are we even talking about? You don't even, haven't even had elections. Like, I don't no even know. Elections, like, no elections, no collective bargaining, no opposition parties. Some law you got there. Yeah. So it, it it's just it. It, the whole thing is 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 terrifying, and and again, you're just talking about desperation. It, it, there's a little bit that shows the desperation, but I think that that it shows the apathy. We really don't care. We don't care what you think, what you say. If you die, we don't we don't care. We do what we yeah. want. And now Ukraine yeah. does, allowing a Ukrainian regime to do what they want is pretty pretty terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that is a big part of this. Uh, you know, a big part of the silence on the part of the United States, a big part of how they've behaved from the State Department, ever, you know, uh, on down the entire administration regarding this issue. But really the behavior of the United States now with regard to Ukraine, there is this on the one hand, especially in the beginning, the first year, year and a half uh, into the summer so-called counteroffensive, a lot of enthusiasm. But even we could see. Vilnius, of course, was a big moment, but we could see even before then, the enthusiasm was waning a bit. But uh, ever, but but really, I think we've seen a real uh, that that word apathy really strikes me because when it comes to I, Marx Lodo calls it the blob, but it's really like the U.S. foreign policy establishment when it comes to U.S. foreign policy objectives, apathy is a pretty good term for. What generally occurs when, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, uh, 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 wars waged by the United States become permanent. And that's exactly what is the best case scenario now for the United States is for this to just continue on with some level of uh, energy behind it. But... Uh, as long as there is a Ukrainian regime that's that is subservient to the U.S. and NATO, that seems to be the the best that they're hoping for at this point. That it just exists and that it continues to fight. Yeah. So, with all of that said, I mean, it, it, yeah, of course, who cares about Gonzalo? Who cares about really anything that happens with regard to this? Who cares about what Ukraine does? Because don't care. we're seeing Zelensky fly off the handle almost every single day. And I don't see a really strong reaction from the United States. Maybe some uh, terse words in, in the Western mainstream media about maybe getting a little tired of him. But it but certainly isn't uh, leading to massive change. Even uh, the admission that the counteroffensive was a massive failure came out in the New York yeah. Times in the last couple of days. So they're literally telling you we wasted all of your time, money and the deaths and the lives of at least half a million Ukrainians. And we don't care. We don't care. We're going to put it right front and center in the New York Times, and we're going to continue on. And then they send more money to Ukraine. And then Zelensky's begging for more air defense in, in the Baltics. Like, exactly what she said. I've heard multiple people keep saying the phrase frozen conflict. That's code word for forever war. That's code word mm -hmm. for we'll put this on the back burner and we'll reheat it when we're ready to reheat or when we want to start poking at Russia again. And this is what happens when the only thing backing your dollar is the is your country's military might. And now that that's falling apart with the petrodollar losing its uh, appeal um, and more and more countries leaving SWIFT or, or learning how to do doing transactions off SWIFT or Iran doing transactions with bartering, which is just something that the West is like bartering. What the hell is that? But, uh, you know, and, and you see your, your, everything is a nail when you're only a hammer, when you just have a whole bunch of hammers, like everything is a nail. So that's kind of, what we're seeing and keeping these these kind of these wars kind of like heat them up, bring them back, bring them back down, heat them up. That's it's really all that's left to support the United States dollar. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing Serbia, Kosovo. I mean, we saw Serbia with the color revolution activity flare up. Kosovo, I know, is getting some missiles, <laughs> uh, uh, military aid from the U.S. I mean, there's yeah, yeah it seems like just jumping the map jumping around the map uh throwing pasta against the wall seeing what sticks uh it, it's exactly. it's certainly it's yeah, exactly yeah. that it's the let's see like who we can go into this next ecuador 
Um, we had issues in uh, Venezuela. Right. Now we're seeing issues in attempted color revolution in Serbia. We're seeing some little bit of activity in Armenia, Azerbaijan. Like, it's exactly that. It's kind of like, where can we go? Where can we go next? We're kind of running out of options and people are sick of the bull. But mm. who can we trick? Is there anybody left on the planet that we can trick? So that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah. And uh, in this uh, latest on uh, Yemen, they, they couldn't, uh, to me, one of the biggest um, maybe red flags for uh, especially the U.S. Uh, it, and its hegemonic status, one of the big red flags for it was uh, not being able to convince Saudi Arabia to uh, even just intensify a war that it's literally been waging for <laughs> more than a decade. Uh, Saudi Arabia could not be coaxed into doing just what it had been doing before. Uh, that I think that shows, uh, and, and also BRICS membership and all the other developments that have surrounded Saudi Arabia and really the region. Um, it shows that Gonzalo's death is kind of a marker for where U.S. hegemony is at. It's uh, Julian Assange's imprisonment is also another one of these markers. But really, all of the people that have either died or are incarcerated for political reasons, there's many of those in the United States, they're, uh, and certainly around the world, uh, there are many U.S.-aligned regimes that are also uh, um, doing these kinds of things. So I think it's a pretty big marker of, of where U.S. hegemony is at, and that is mm -hmm. uh, desperate times call for desperate measures. Exactly. So it's good news and bad news. It's kind of like just hold on tight. Like this could be almost over. It's it's kind of we're kind of just at that at that stage right now. It's everything we're seeing is indicative of their loss of of power, whether it's soft power, military power, anything. Um, so it's it's good news, but it also means that there's probably a lot of pain uh, in the very near future before we we kind of uh, get through this sort of. Uh, dying of the leviathan kind of <laughs> taking everybody down with them thank you for tuning in to my latest video i appreciate all of your support this channel however needs your help i am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.